You are listening to the PRO Media Network, the next level in entertainment. with the sports coma with Big Q and the guy. And we have intense, entertaining, educating, and enlightening sport talk from your favorite sports family. Of course, I'm Big Q. And chime in in podcast 210. That's right, 210 on the sports coma. Recapping the Saints 24 the 20 win over the Jacksonville Jaguars in the 2018 first preseason game as the Saints have a little competition as they look to refine their team moving ahead. Ugly win, but nonetheless a win. And anytime you can get a win in preseason, regular season, anywhere in the NFL is a good thing. Best believe that. Some people say it might not count, but a win is a win, even in preseason. So let's get right into it on the rundown. Thank you all for joining us today on episode 210 on the Sports Coma recap in the Saints and Jags game. Interesting game, man. Very interesting uh, as well with this game. I'll take a look at some of the things that I witnessed in this affair with the, the Saints and the Jags. 24 to 20 game. The first team defense not looking so hot. A lot of people can attest to that and say that the first team defense, especially in, in particular, the pass rush wasn't there. It didn't look too good. The secondary. And we know, you know, some of this you could take with a grain of salt being that the defensive schemes are purposefully vanilla as not to show too much as the regular season go in. So people could use tape to kind of prepare for you. So this is a long used strategy that most teams use to keep defense and play calling as vanilla as possible. Vanilla or not, the Saints were still able to win this game with their second and third teamers late in the game, which is encouraging. But as far as everything else, it didn't look too good. So in this 30-minute podcast recapping the Jags and the Saints game, we're going to just pretty much go over um, some of the particular plays, the studs and duds, as you will, in this game. How could we not look at some of these, the, the contributions to some of these defensive players who I will talk about? I mean... You know, I'm a Mitch Lowen guy. And Mitch Lowen plays like you're supposed to play. He gives full effort on every play. Possessions, Mitch Lowen was out there. He was able to make contributions on defense. I mean, he was in the backfield. He was getting things done. He was making things happen. He was constantly, without without any issue or problem whatsoever, able to penetrate and get into the get into the offensive background of most of these people. So, I mean, uh, Mitch Lowen is definitely a guy who the Saints need to keep on the roster. Of course, he was on the roster last year. I think this time around, Mitch Lowen will probably be uh, someone you uh, need to definitely give more minutes to. I know he was hurt last year, but Mitch Lowen, good grief. Big, big ups to him. J. Ron Elliott's another guy. I mean, we're going to get into it, but uh, before we even jump on the defense, let's start off with the offense, man. Saints 24-20 to win. Of course, they struggle much of the first half of the game as Jacksonville's first team offense led by Blake Bartles were able to do some things to the Saints defense that wasn't encouraging. Of course, Leonard Finette's a handful anytime he <laughs> you're playing him, whether it's in uh, preseason or not. But we can't have Cody Kessler who comes in and throws goes 14 for 17 for 139 yards and a touchdown. And Blake Bartles does six of nine for 53 yards against your first team and large a lot of that was against first team talent that can't happen but let's look at what the saints did okay starting off with the quarterbacks the prima downs Taysom hill eight of nine 72 yards eight yard average on the throw he of course had two sacks um he was took down twice for nine uh, minus nine yards now Taysom hill to me 
looked better than Tom Savage, even though Tom Savage had a 10 of 14 rating for 70 yards. And you look at the stats, if you just look at the highlights, you say, okay, Tom Savage had a pretty good game, not so much. Taysom Hill looked a lot better out there than Tom Savage did. And I expected a little bit more out of a veteran quarterback like Tom Savage, throwing the ball behind receivers and not leading them like you're supposed to. That's something that a veteran's supposed to know what to do. I don't care if you're on a different team or not. That scheme, that don't change. That kind of uh, mindset translates to throwing the ball or throwing the receiver open and not throwing it behind him where he's forced to try to reach back behind him to make the play. That kind of stuff, man, I just expected a lot better from Tom Savage. I think he'll probably get better, hopefully, as he moves forward. Taysom Hill, on the other hand, 8 of 9. Now, he was sacked a couple of times in this game because of shitty offensive line play. Sorry for that, but I just have to call it as I see it. Shitty offensive line play. I, Josh Larebus need to get his game up, man. Josh Larebus looked like he was wearing skates and the defensive linemen were pushing him around. Then the backup offensive linemen were just as terrible. Landon Turner and the rest of those guys, uh, Michael Ola, those guys looked terrible. You know, they look terrible. I And it just like, wow, I expect the offensive second team, those offensive linemen, backup guys, to look that terrible. Just didn't look good to me. They didn't protect Taysom Hill. Of course, he was under pressure. He was forced to run. He carried the ball. Of course, ran seven times for 52 yards, averaging seven and a half, uh, running the ball. And he even, he even had a score. The longest run he had was about 21 yards. Uh, behind him, Jonathan Williams was very impressive as well. He had four carries for 26 yards and six and a half average and a score. And Jonathan Williams had a very impressive, uh, what was it, 13-yard run when he was able to break out. I don't know how he made it out of that pile. I don't know how the hell he made it out of that pile, but he did, and he just kept running. And that's encouraging because we definitely could use a guy that can run like that because that offensive line didn't help out too much with the pass blocking and damn sure in the run block and they didn't look good. Mark Ingram was behind him. Mark had seven carries for 23 yards, even had a score on the night. His longest run was 12. Elvin Kamara had three carries for 11 yards uh, on that night. Terrence West, a lot of people saying Terrence West has to step his game up. He didn't look too good this game. Five carries, 10 yards. Boston Scott had one carry at seven yards on that play. Shane Vereen, three carries for five yards. Then the uh, rest of those guys had one carry. Tom Savage, Trey Edmonds, and JT Barrett scrambled. Uh, he was sacked for a minus two. JT Barrett's another guy uh, talking about the quarterbacks. Didn't look too good to me. Didn't look comfortable. Had a wide open touchdown for whatever reason. Chose to take a sack in the red zone as opposed to attempt to throw the ball. Even if he threw the ball over his head, at least he attempted to throw the damn ball out there to a wide open guy. Uh, just kept it in his damn, it just kept it and took the sack. That is totally terrible. Of course, Sean Payton kind of shook his head with that move. And I only really seen Sean Payton shake his head three times this game, okay? Of course, he had a few times where he put his head down, but shaking his head, noticeably shaking his head on bad plays, I've seen it at least three times, and those three times, one of the times was when JT Barrett took that sack, and the other two times we'll get to it um, as uh, down into the show. Also, the, the receiving game, guys, big up to Traquan Smith. Four catches, 48 yards, averaging about 12 yards a catch. He was targeted five times, caught four of the five. The longest was with 25, just snatching the ball out the air. Traquan Smith is just, uh, he just looked terrific, man. I, I mean, I just have to say it, he just looked awesome. And if Traquan Smith keeps building on this, we got something there. Imagine something like, Cam, we got Cameron Meredith, Traquan Smith, all those guys out there, but Traquan looked ter- terrific. Did look just looked terrific. Other guys on the wide receivers as well. Josh Huff, he had a couple of catches for 17 yards. Keith Kirkwood, the, the undrafted wide receiver, trying to make something happen. He had two catches for 17 yards. Of course, Mike Thomas, Iron Mike Thomas, two catches, 16 yards. Dan Arnold, uh, the very talked about former wide receiver, converted to tight end. He had a couple of catches, two catches for 14 yards. Uh, and uh, the longest was a 12-yard. Tay again had a couple of carry, uh, catches, two for 13 as well in the game. Josh Hill, Elvin, Kamara, Shane Barine, and the rest of those guys also caught passes in this game. Now, the interesting thing to kind of put out there about uh, the New Orleans Saints offense is it struggled mightily most of the first half, and eventually it was able to catch on with the second teamers coming late in the game to obviously seal the deal uh, 24 to 20. Very interesting. Some of the guys that I want to talk about about 
that on the offensive line, uh, uh, on the offensive side of the ball, uh, is guys like Taysom Hill who stood out to me. Taysom Hill, eight of nine, throwing the ball 72 yards, and then seven carries for 52 yards, scampering and getting a touchdown, running with his legs. Very interesting, man, to see a quarterback, a New Orleans Saints quarterback, by the way, who has wheels like him who can get out of trouble and run. And, of course, the offensive line didn't do him no favors as he was forced to uh, run at – at uh, random, I mean, he if maybe he could have we could have stood in there and see him throw a deep ball or two. But um, love I would love to see more of Taysom Hill as the preseason progressive. Hopefully, hopefully Sean Payton could uh, allow him to have some more time so we can better gauge who Taysom Hill and what he could be. A lot of potential there. Of course, J T. Barrett's another guy. Uh, didn't do too much for me to talk about. Blew that, blew that wide open touchdown. You you couldn't have handed a, a rookie quarterback an easier play than to throw the ball out in the flat to this man, and he could have had an easy score. Missed it. Missed it. Damn sure missed it. Um, major, major, major moves. Very interesting. Got us a gauge to finally see the, the team compete with other people. In, in this game. Also, a lot, I like how Jonathan Williams did what he did in the game, showing that power. That was really excellent uh, to see what he did. Dan Arnold. Dan Arnold's a guy I'm talking about on the offense as well. Dan Arnold, the question I proposed uh, posed earlier in the pie, in the previous podcast was Dan Arnold looks every bit of, the, uh, of a, tie, a tight end, the new style tight end, sleek, slender, could move, could catch, but can he block? That's the thing. I've seen, I've seen Dan Arnold in a few uh, more than a few plays during this game make very competent blocks, you know, and that's encouraging because the Saints might have found something. Of course, all the Saints tight ends, all those guys, Ben Watson, who man, Josh Hill, all of those guys are on one year contracts, by the way. And I don't think that most of those guys are going to come back. So I'm Dan Arnold could be a steal for the Saints, converting him from wide receiver to tight end. He could be a steal. He definitely has the speed. Uh, he's showing that he could block. He did actually did a pretty damn good job of blocking out there. And if 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 anything, I mean, if he can keep doing what he's doing, I think Dan Arnold definitely has to climb up into the depth chart. Of course, uh, Dion Yelder, who was a f- real popular choice when the Saints were able to bring him on as an undrafted tight end in here was a guy a lot of people had his had their eyes on but he had not looked too well in camp this game he looked uh lost as well and that's to be expected with a guy like that but as far as I'm concerned Dan Arnold looks to be every bit of climbing a depth chart and moving ahead he looks comfortable uh real comfortable in that same system and something we might have found something in uh young Dan Arnold, uh, Trey Edmonds. Trey Edmonds is a guy that's real interesting too. Of course, the Saints were using Trey Edmonds mostly at fullback, like an H back type of thing, and um, that's interesting to see if Trey Edmonds. He really he he played some nothing outstanding from Trey Edmonds, but perhaps uh, we could see Trey uh, Trey Edmonds in a in a role as the H back, possibly make the team. He surprised a lot of people last year when he made his made the team uh, for the Saints. He was a long shot. Dog, underdog then he surprised a lot of people made the team and perhaps he can do it again this year as well and it's, it's very interesting the offense man uh young players a lot of the young personnel for the Saints actually stepping up uh and playing a very good game also Ted again Jr. Very interesting. Ted again had a couple of catches in this game. One was a nine yard catch. A lot of people think Ted again is going to lose his starting position. I don't know if to say Ted again is going to lose. I think Ted again is he had a strong. He's had been having a strong camp thus far. He looked pretty much comfortable in this game as well. And Ted again speed at you can't dispute his speed. I mean he's a blazer, and you have a few guys that can run, but Ted again Jr. has got to be the fastest guy on this team. Maybe you can put him in a foot race with both Scott and perhaps Tommy Lee Lewis, but man, I put my money on Ted again Jr. Even over 30 years old. When he came in the league, he was Deion Sanders quick. Now he might just be you know, top 5%, but even at 30, this man's still blazing. Blazing speed. 4-3 speed, perhaps uh, closer to the 4-4s, but Ted again Jr., man, gonna be hard to unseat him, but Trey Quan Smith's the man to try. But anyway, when we come back on the other side of the break, we get into the defense how the defense played the special teams as well and we'll talk about some injury news and other things on the other side to break you're listening to the sports coma with big q and the guy stay with us 
What's up, sports world? The PRO Media Network is on a mission to reach 10,000 subscribers. So besides our regular programs, like the Sports Coma with Big Q and the guys, the Pelican Post Game Report, Rapid Fire TSC, and others, we will be expanding out and offering other content like movie, anime, and gaming reviews for your entertainment. So if you enjoy our content, please donate at our Patreon page. Also subscribe, comment, and share. And help the PRO Media Network reach 10,000 subs. Peace. What's up, sports world? This Big Q from the Sports Coma with Big Q and the guys. Talking to you about the website, theposhlifestyle.com. That's right, poshlifestyle.com. A great website where you can get great products at great prices. They sell organic herbs, vitamins, supplements, water filters for your home, EMF and cell phone radiation protection, healing magnetics, and healing crystals, personal protection devices like cell phones, stun guns, and mace spray, organic deodorants, shampoos, soaps, toothpaste, and more. They also sell 10A grade Brazilian hair. 10A music is available now. All kind of the latest downloadable mixtapes. So what are you waiting for? Head on over to theposhlifestyle.com. That's the posh lifestyle. Life spell with a Y. L Y F D style.com. Put in the sports coma for the 10% discount on your purchase. It's a win-win. So get your mind and body right with the posh lifestyle. Follow the sports coma on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Welcome back to the Sports Coma with Big Q and the guys. We're talking Saints recapping Saints 24 to 20 win over the Jacksonville Jaguars. And like I said before, any win that you can get at any time of the year in NFL season is a good win. And the Saints got one. They had to sweat it out a little bit against Jacksonville. The second and third team guys picked up the wheel to win and carry the game. So big ups to them for doing that. Of course, Heading into this game, the Saints were without a few people, including first-round draft pick Marcus Davenport, still dealing with a pull groin. Left guard Andrews Pete were still recovering from that broken fibula. He was absent. Wide receiver Cameron Meredith, he didn't play as well from that recovery from that torn ACL. Benjamin Watson, Manti Teo, who was listed on the unofficial depth chart, he didn't play. Wide receiver Austin Carr, tight end Michael Hula, uh, who man, wide receiver Tommy Lee Lewis, uh, rookie safety Cameron Moore, who's dealing with a hamstring, and center Cameron Tom's shoulder. They didn't dress or play in that matchup. So that was uh, the, the header going into the game. Outside of that, getting into this segment of show, of course, the first segment we dealt with, the, we talked exclusively about the offense. This time around, we'll talk about, hey, guess what? The defense and the defense and perhaps the special teams as well. Uh, we'll mention them as well because um, I'm looking at a lot of things that happened in this game defensively, and it's a lot to talk about. A lot of the uh, stars happen on the defensive side of the ball. A lot of the major plays happen on the de- defensive side of the ball. And let me start by saying Mitch Lowen, which I mentioned this early in the show. Mitch Lowen is terrific. He plays with all. He 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 doesn't know. He he has one gear, and that's full. Uh, full speed. He had six tackles and six, and all of them were solo, which two of those were for losses. He also had a QB hit in that game. And he had a, one of those tackles. He actually ran from the line of scrimmage to chase down a wide receiver and send him the field to make the tackle. Mitch Lowen's all over the place. And he's a handful for people trying to block him. He's constantly uh, pushing and providing pressure to get into the quarterback's backfield. He looked terrific in this game. He just popped out at the tape. Jerome Elliott is another guy that popped at the tape. He should be basically by all accounts the player of the game because of the kind of contributions Jerome Elliott put up. He had five total he had five total tackles four of them were solo he had two and a half sacks two one of the one tackle for loss and one QB hit so Jaron Elliott also responsible for a couple of fumbles as well he was absolutely awesome in this game they could not stop Mr. Jaron Elliott who is a guy that is considered by many a hybrid type of defensive 
player because he can play defensive end and also play linebacker for you. So with that kind of skill and perhaps that he keeps playing at this level, he could he might be able to stick around. So he definitely improved his chances of making a roster. Devereaux Lawrence was another guy that we could speak about. Devereaux Lawrence played really good. He had five total tackles in this game, three of which was solo, and he had two sacks in a game with three QB hits. Devereaux Lawrence, the defensive tackle, who could play nose uh, tackle as well. This guy was absolutely a monster, a beast, providing pressure up the middle. And, of course, people are going to say, well, Q, man, he's playing against second-string competition. you got to dominate whoever you line up against. You know, so um, remember this happened with Mr. El Kadeem Muhammad, who we've not been hearing anything from. El Kadeem started the game. He actually started a defensive end against first stringers, and he, he didn't hit a lick at a stick. El Kadeem having a real quiet, quiet camp and a real quiet preseason thus far. Hopefully he can break out and make his presence known as well. Outside of those top defensive linemen, I want to say, the secondary actually, uh, the first team secondary didn't look all that good. Ken Crawley was a guy that uh, continues to astound me at times. Ken Crawley looks like a starting level uh, caliber, NFL caliber cornerback at times, and at times he doesn't look like it. You know, he's fundamentally, what I can say about Ken Crawley before you walk it is that he's fundamentally unsound. And what I mean by that is when the ball is in the hell, Ken Crawley does not locate the ball. Even when the receiver's staring back, he never whips his head around to find where the ball is. How are you going to make interceptions of plays on the ball when you're never turning around to locate where the ball is in the air? I mean, it's just – and listen, with Marshawn Lattimore, who was solid in his game – with him playing the way he's going to play in this upcoming season, I think he's going to only get better. So a lot of those balls are going to go to people like uh, Ken Crawley. They're going to be throwing in his direction, and he's going to have to learn how to make plays on those on those type of uh, situations. But anyway, let's keep it moving, man. Let's uh, talk about uh, other players like Patrick Robinson, who was okay in his game, had a breakup, a pass breakup uh, in the game with three tackles. Kurt Coleman finished with three tackles. Banjo, uh, Chris Banjo, and Justin Hardy, and Alexander Lone, the alums with George Johnson, all had three tackles apiece. George Johnson had a half a sack in the game as he provided pressure. And Justin Hardy, man, Chris Banjo's also is, continues to be a special teams ace outside of that. You look at a guy like Justin Hardy, my goodness, Justin Hardy, I love his special teams play, but good grief, man. If something never happened to one of our DBs and Justin Hardy had to fill in, we in trouble. I mean, he just doesn't look comfortable out there as a cornerback or a defensive back and playing i mean he just doesn't look comfortable you know and you might have to be a guy that the saints plug in back there i just don't know about justin hart it's very interesting alexander Loney looked terrific in this game as usual taylor stalwart was big as he produced two tackles uh he also had a sack and a qb hit in this game he looked terrific and the rest of the saints played well demario davis you know, uh, those guys were okay. P.J. Williams looked okay in this game. Of course, he made a really good tackle, dragging the guy down. And, of course, I think he got a little banged up and he had to leave the game. But um, P.J. Williams got to avoid those injuries, man, and just stuff like that seems to happen to P.J. And this is his uh, final con- – he has one year left on his contract here, and he's trying to prove to the Saints that he could possibly be a guy – that can help this team in any capacity win. So it's going to be interesting to see if uh, P.J. Williams sticks around, but he has to be uh, able to still be out there to play. So we're going to see uh, how P.J. Very interesting day here for P.J. Williams. But he was knocked out of the game with bruised ribs. So outside of the bruised ribs, nothing else to report on on P.J. Williams. But uh, the Saints, man, defensively speaking, they were okay in the game. Uh, They looked okay. The second team guys really stepped up and showed they – had a lot of spunk. Von Bell changed his number from 48 to 24, and he looked terrible in one play, which was basically he was responsible for giving that guy the tight end the touchdown. He basically played the guy 10 yards off in the red zone, then goes up to try to make the tackle, misses the tackle, and allows the guy. It's just, man, come on, Von Bell. Come on. You might solve this question for us, which is which two safeties when they play the 4-3 look with the Saints going to stick with. Marcus Williams having a knockout camp. And Kurt Coleman didn't blow the doors off, but he damn sure didn't make a silly uh, silly ass mistake like missing a tackle on a slow full tight end. He damn sure didn't do that garbage. So 
uh, get better with that, please. Trey Hendrickson also was in this game. He provided pressure. And, of course, guys like Alta Millette, who made a solid pass defense, he was in the game, looked pretty good. Alta Millette played the ball really well and laid out the knock. If he wouldn't have played it, that guy possibly would have caught that ball and ran for the touchdown. So Alta Millette looking real confident in the second year with the Saints as he's moving forward. Natrell Jamerson was also another guy. You got to keep your eyes open for Natrell Jamerson. Uh, besides the unofficial depth chart listing him, Ahead of other guys like Arthur Millett, Natrol Jameson is he has the size, he has the speed, he's played multiple positions, and I would say if you got to look out for a defensive back, this guy is a guy that you possibly could look out for. Of course, him and P.J. Williams are friends, but uh, P.J.'s playing on his last legs here. All those injuries with Stan, and he has to have the best year of the Saints to be going forward. And but Natrol Jameson, high ceiling, a lot of potential from him. Let's also. Let's take a look at some of the special teams, guys, as we go. Well, you know what? Before we even go special teams, I got one more guy to talk about. And I remember early in the show that I talked about three situations, at least three, where I seen Sean Payton shake his head. You know, one of them being the play which JT Barrett was supposed to throw uh, the wide open touchdown to Bo Scott, but didn't do it, but took the sack. The other two were both times back to back interference calls, holding calls, on one Devontae Harris. Now, Devontae Harris shook his head both times at that play. It's like foolish play by Devontae Harris. Devontae Harris has decent size. He has decent speed. But when the lights come on, it's like he just gets lost. It's like uh, all this practice, this guy been in here just as long as Ken Crawley. But you're talking about a guy that's so fundamentally unsound that you can play well in training camp. But when it comes down to game environment, this guy just absolutely is lost. He doesn't know where to be. Uh, his his fundamentals go out the window. Maybe he's just he's just not going to get it here. And uh, according to information that we got, look like he's the the Saints see see our point. Sean Payton uh, was a guy that shook his head both times because those both of those were boneheaded plays by Devontae Harris, and ultimately they're going to cost him as the Saints did release Devontae one game into the preseason. So there you go, uh, Devontae Harris. Wow, so he's out the door. And remember the Saints did release him before, but then brought him back to the practice squad. I don't know if that's one of these years, but they probably say, listen, man, we done seen enough of Devontae Harris. Devontae Harris has been here for two or three damn years. Devontae Harris still playing with the same damn scheme, the same people teaching the same stuff, and you still doing the same boneheaded stuff that you did when you first came in as a Saint. We can't have that. So, uh, Devontae, uh, sorry, but we got other guys like Cameron Moore. We got other guys like Natrell Jamerson. We got other guys like Arthur Millette who are not doing boneheaded stuff like that, who's been here in less time than you in picking up the scheme. So, hasta la vista, and good luck to you, Mr. Devontae Harris. Devontae's out the door. Let's go into the special teams talk before we clear out the show. Now, of course, the Saints are adamant. Of course, you remember they brought Westhoff back after he had the surgery. They wanted him back with Bradford Bannon, the special teams coordinator, and Kevin O'Dea. Both of those guys had coordinated experience and to correct some of the mistakes that were happening. Of course, Sean Payton sought out Westhoff and brought him in, Mike Westhoff. Westhoff said, listen, man, last year he did terrific strides in helping the Saints clean, uh, clean up a lot of those special teams era errors that they were having. Of course, he's back this year to help refine. He's out there talking, yelling at player personnel on special teams with these new rule changes. And of course, why I bring that up is the fact that the Saints are adamant about attempting to find kick returners. Now, of course, you know that from Michael Floyd and Brandon Tate, we were looking at more Michael Floyd than Brandon Tate. But if you look at it, it might be more Brandon Tate than Michael Floyd because Brandon Tate is a guy that could add to the Saints special team because they've been looking after that sought after kick returner for some time now. Saints just recently saw, solved the kicker crisis. Remember, we had the kicker crisis. We had a kicker every year for 10 some odd years remember that well the Saints finally solved their kicker crisis with Will Lutz a year ago now the Saints are focusing on fixing the kick return and punt return crisis we haven't had a solid kick return punt return Sean Payton big credit to him putting a lot of resources into the special teams finally realizing that if you have a really good kick return and punt returner back there they can perhaps start you at the 30 and 40 yard line a short giving quarterback like Drew Brees and that's offense a short field as opposed to those guys always got to work all the way back from the 20 and 25 yard line Bo Scott 
and Brandon Tate both showed a lot in the kick return games for this teams in this in this game. Bo Scott had three kick returns for 78 yards. He averaged 26 yards on um, on that average. He had a, the longest was 35 yarder. Brandon Tate had two for 59, averaging uh, just under 30 yards on kick return average. Then he had the longest was a 36 yard run. So both Bo Scott and Brandon Tate bringing some heat and competition to that kick return game. And both those guys could be able to contribute when Sundays roll around. So that'll be an interesting play as well to see how that will all work out. So keep an eye on tune on that. But that'll do it for the show. Thank you for listening to the Sports Coma with Big Q and the guy. Episode 210. As always, if you enjoy the show, please go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash the PRO Media Network and donate. We got many different different options there for you to donate. If you want to be a one-time donator, that's fine. If you want to be some guy, that, that, somebody that does it on a monthly basis, trust me, it will make that go a long way here at the PRO Media Network. And also join the, the social media pages at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and uh, Pinterest. As always, thank you for listening. Sports Coma. I'm BQ. Peace. for listening to the Pro Media Network, who provides hours and hours of free entertainment to you and yours. If you are benefiting positively from our content, please donate to help us grow our platform by going to www.patreon.com slash the Pro Media Network. That's www.patreon.com slash the Pro Media Network. And support the true independent artists. In today's world, children are bombarded with negativity on television, online, and at school. Our kids need to have a positive outlook on life and the world around them. I want to share with you a valuable resource you can use to bring positivity into your child's life. It's the new book, 101 Powerful Children Affirmations, A Guide to Positive Child Self-Image. From author and dad, G.J. Barabino. This is a simple guide loaded with wonderful and inspirational affirmations designed to uplift young people's spirits. This positive and powerful children affirmational is chock full and loaded with wonderful inspirational sayings that will lift your child's self-image to whole new levels through the awesome power of spoken word. 101 Powerful Children Affirmations, a guide to positive child self-image from author and dad, G.J. Barabino. Available on Amazon. Order a copy for yourself, your child's teachers, or anyone you know with children. 101 Powerful Children Affirmations, a guide to positive child self-image. Order your copy today. 